I'm Jeremy Till, and this is Amplify. Jay, the co-author of The One Thing, very honored to have Jay here, New York Times bestseller of multiple books. His wisdom, insight, and approach to life is very respectable and just appreciate his words of wisdom. I know you'll enjoy this podcast. Definitely go out and get Jay's book, The One Thing. There's a lot to be learned from it and a lot of great insights and skills. So check it out. If you were to describe yourself um, in the sense of that, like the different roles that you play and where you show up as, you know, a businessman um, on your day to day, just tell us about what you do and and what that looks like. Well, the the roles I think about first and foremost, and I think you know this from knowing my wife, Wendy, is first as husband, second as father, um, and then business owner, employee. And I think they each have different levels of responsibility. And as long as those are lined up, my priorities tend to fall in place. So when I think about where I have to make a stand each day, it kind of goes in that order. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm not a good husband, I don't think by default I can be a good father. That's why those go that way. And there's debate on that, right? So you can say families first. Um, as a business owner, there are people depending on me making the right decisions for their livelihood. And then as an employee, I have a responsibility to the person who's taking the risk in that business. Mm-hmm. So I, walk, I wake up in the morning, I look at my calendar, and I've got it blocked out to make sure that those priorities being hit in the right order. Absolutely. That's a very high level. We can go into more detail. Yeah, I definitely want to get into detail, um, you know, first as a, a business owner. Yeah. And talk about the businesses that you do own. All right, so um, as a business owner... When I think about my number one job, you look at it and I think the, as a founder, I'm not often the CEO. That's one of the things, the questions you'll ask me, like, what is my biggest challenge? I'm an introvert. Mm. And as someone who owns businesses, that's not ideal because a lot of what drives a business is the relationships you build and how you get out in front to build the image and brand of the company. And that's something that I have to force or do purposefully. It's not going to come naturally. So... For me, the jobs are going to be vision, right? Do I have the right vision in place? Are we going in the right direction? Do we have the right standards in place so that we can hit that? And then three for me is people. Do I have the right people around me to make that vision come true? Because a huge theme of my life is if I'm not going to be the guy who's going to be the builder, then I have to be purposeful about always finding that person. You know, he or she is going to be more responsible for the day to day than I will because I'm not physically, mentally, behaviorally inclined to do that every day. Meaning it's just not going to be my best effort. I can force it in sprints, but I'm being someone I'm not meant to be. When I'm in the creative space, I mean, I'm a writer first and foremost, right? Then vision comes easy, like modeling business. What's the strategy? Where are we going? I love that part. But going out and like, pounding the phones, trying to get customers, that's miserable work for me. I'll do it when I have to, but I go out and look. So I look at my life. I've got um, my wife and I have built a real estate investment company. Um, She is the CEO of that and our real estate sales team, which has been a million dollar plus revenue business for, I guess we've had it open for six years now. In the last two and a half, we've kind of been over that threshold, which I kind of consider kind of a good milestone to think it's a business worth owning. So those are the two that she runs. Um, I help build them both, but day to day, she's a CEO and she's a natural CEO. Um, I own a publishing company with Gary. Um, What's great about that is my main job is to write perfect business for an introvert to own, right? And then um, we now have a new company that we built, which is an online training company. And for that, I knew that was gonna be a bigger endeavor. I can think of strategy, vision, standards, but I needed someone. So I spent a year and a half looking for the right person to build that business. And I ended up recruiting a guy, um, used to be in medical sales from San Diego, Jeff Woods, Mm -hmm. and super connector, like his superpower is networking, right? The very thing I'm bad at. He invited me on his podcast, kept following up with me like a good salesperson would. And like three months later I said, hey, how can I help you, Jay? It's like a Twitter message. And I said, you know, I'm looking for someone to build a publishing and training company. And he says, let's get on the phone, I know people. 
And at the end of that phone call, he said, can I call you back tomorrow? What I didn't know, he had to go home and ask permission from his wife to apply for the job. And so we got him last November, and we've been off to the races with that business. So I just knew if I started it, that uncomfortable job would be mine. But if I was willing to be patient, I could find the right person, and then we could aggressively build it together. And that theme, though, like if you, the moment you involve the second person right from the beginning, you've got to have a big enough vision for both of you. Mm-hmm. So that's usually, thank you, thank you, Gary Keller, my writing partner. He thinks crazy big all the time, so he's always pushing me. So I had to immediately think, well, if I would like a business that did this for me, it has to even be even bigger so that it also fulfills Jeff's dreams, and he's helping me build a business that he would want to have ownership in. Does that make sense? So those are the four primary jobs or ownerships. Then I have a job at Keller Williams Realty. Got it. So just kind of like the chicken or the egg, which one came first? So Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams Real right. Estate, um, is who you're partner with with publishing, mm-hmm. and uh, now the community drive of that business. Um, what did you start in real estate first with Wendy, or how the relationship start? It all with- comes back to the books. So you know, I was a editor at HarperCollins in New York. That's where I met my wife. Um, and we got married up there, ended up long story, how we ended up in Austin, but we just moved here without jobs. And after a year of freelancing from the apartment, she said, you got to go get a job because you're not meeting anybody. You know, I was happy to sit there, write my things, play Diablo and go to the movies. Right. Mm -hmm. Just, I could be as introverted as I could be. And she's like, you got to get out of the house. So I took a job. How old were y'all when y'all moved here? Uh, so I would have been 30. This was in 2000. 2000. Yep. And so it was uh, about seven, eight months after we got married, we quit our jobs and went on a five-month backpacking trip in Europe and North Africa. It was a good way to segue, right? We Mm -hmm. thought, okay, we won't segue like this many times in our life. Let's go crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we land here without jobs. I freelance. She freelances. She gets a job. Eventually, I am forced to get a job. Smart move by my wife. And I took a job as a newsletter writer for Gary. Back then, Keller Williams was really small. It was like 6,700 agents in 2000. And today it's got 145,000 agents. It's the largest in the world. And so like I had a little job and I took role after role after role. And in 2002, he found out I was an editor. I found out he was writing a book. We partnered and wrote our first book together. And succeeding at that role, like bringing the vision and the ability to write books with him, has opened up all the other doors. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't even own a house, right, before I met Gary. You know, I didn't even think about owning a house. I was you know, happily renting across from where Uchi is now. Um, we got a, landed an apartment that didn't require you to have a driver's license because I hadn't had one like in seven years. A whole other story, right? And it was like, but we were just kind of moving through life and just doing what we enjoyed to do. And then that connection, I started doing the research in the books I was like, wow, we need to invest in real estate. So we first started with a home, turned our first home into a rental, which you've been staying in at different times. So we've got our little rental properties there. And then when Wendy decided to come back to the workforce after our second child got to kindergarten, I was like knee deep in the real estate world. And I said, you're good at this. Like I had helped acquire the properties. She was managing them as her stay at home mom job. I said, consider a job in real estate. And that launched the real estate business. So, But it all comes back to writing books with a guy who owns a giant real estate company who has a big vision and was kind of mentoring and pushing me to think bigger and bigger. So all of those kind of dominoes come back to, and it still comes down to, if I don't do a good job there, none of these other opportunities show up. The mm-hmm. books have funded almost all of these other opportunities as well. And so now, just through your language, I can hear you very, live a very intentional life try. (laughs) Well, absolutely. We're always intentional about being intentional, huh? And so, so walking, moving to Austin, did you and Wendy have a plan to move into entrepreneurship or was it just, it just so happened that way? And then, I mean, because everyone walks into opportunity with a previous life and so curious about your dreams or vision Mm -hmm. and if any of that started to fruit from these relationships or did it just coincidentally occur um well you know coincidence is a word we could just tangle with all day i don't know like i also don't believe in fate but i can tell you the first half of my life i thought that you're supposed to be a good employee 
work hard, get raises and promotions. Like my dad had done that and done great at it. He had been a CEO of two different companies and done really well, but he was always an employee. And a CEO is a different kind of employee. You know, you think of them as a business owner because they have a lot of control over their day to day, but they still are absolutely, you know, accountable to someone else. It's still a role, but that was in my mind what I was after. And the second book that I wrote with Gary Keller, it was a millionaire real estate investor. And part of my job in preparing for that book is I interviewed 120 people who'd become millionaires. And I started to see a pattern. And like, these are people from every walk of life. And I was like, wow, this is very doable if you approach it the right way. And so I just set a goal that I wanted to be financially free. I never wanted to have to work a job that I didn't want to do, right, for someone else because I had to pay the rent or pay the mortgage or whatever. And so Wendy and I sat down, and this would have been in 2004, and we set a goal of becoming millionaires in 10 years. And we set a goal for having enough passive income, right, from whatever we invested in that we didn't have to work. And for us, I mean, we drove, like I drove a Tercel that only had three cylinders working. I mean, I don't have a lot of showy, like I don't need showy stuff to feel good about my life. And I've waited tables and I was like, you know what, if we had $75,000 and we didn't have debt, that's all we need. And so that was our goal for years. And so um, we set out for that and we've bl since blown through it. You know, you set a goal, you think it's going to take forever, but if you're doing the right things, it happens faster. So it starts with financial independence. I know a lot of people have these stories like, oh, I was, you know, starting my first business at age 12. You know, I think back and I got brushes with entrepreneurship. I, you know, I mowed lawns for money. I had my business. I figured out how to con the neighborhood kids who wouldn't hustle for the yards into mowing them for me at the lesson I was making. And it's like, I could tell that story, but there was no dream of being a business ownership. I had little experiences that now I relate back, and now I relate back to being an owner, mm -hmm. but it wasn't in my sights until we wrote that second book. And I realized it was actually maybe three years after we're investing in real estate. And I'm like, wow, this is great for our net worth. This is our paper value. But real estate properties don't generate a lot of cash flow, and that's what you need to live on. And it was just an aha. It's like, we need to own businesses. Mm. And that's when Wendy started a real estate business, and we started to realize, wow, this is a great cash flow business. What else can we do? And over time, the publishing company started delivering more and more dividends. And we just were super disciplined because that, that first dot is financial freedom. So we were trying not to spend our money. I mean, I think for five years, we lived on 65 to 70% of our income and invested the rest. And the foundation for being a millionaire happened before both of our salaries added up to 100,000. Mm -hmm. Just because we were playing this game. How much can we invest? How much can we invest? How much can we invest? And we haven't completely lived that lifestyle since because there becomes a point where you get a little bit relaxed on it, but th those muscles are still strong. Mm -hmm. We still invest a disproportionate amount of our income because the goal is to have the cash flow to do whatever the heck we want every day without having to work for it. Now, people go, well, do you not like to work? It's like retirement sounds like the most boring thing on earth to me. I love working, but I don't want to have to work for someone else. Does that make sense? It makes absolute so sense. So that's the whole drive. Owning businesses was all towards that dream of being financially free. And we define that in the book and in our lives as do we have enough passive income to follow our passion without having to work. In coming to that conclusion on what you desired, where did that thought come from? Oh, gosh, it, it's, a, it's a debate, you know? Like my wife and I are partners. I'm super lucky that, you know, we had no idea where we were going when we got married, but we've been on the journey together. You know, when I started wanting to invest, she was all in. And if you don't have both pieces of a marriage doing the same direction, it's, it's really tough. So she was always in alignment, like, yeah, let's go do that. Sure, I'll start the real estate business. And you know running a business is not easy. You know, there were two nights this week where she woke up at like at 3 a.m. And it just wakes up thinking about the business. You know, the classic, I'm staring at the ceiling because things are going on. And that's no fun because the buck stops with you. But at the, on a greater level, she gets a lot of joy out of it. So we've been able to be in sync towards that big goal. Like, we're just both buying into it. And for us, like... Where does it come from? We both love to travel. You know, the first thing we did when we got married is quit our jobs and went backpacking for five and a half months. And so I know that she's very 
committed at some point in our life, we'll take our family and live overseas somewhere. And to me, my vision, I'd love to be sitting on a porch with my dog and writing books that don't have to sell. You know, like at some point I'll write that novel, like, cause I've always been a book lover, but I've been writing nonfiction. But at some point I'll look up and go, that's the job I don't you know, have to work for. I can just do it for pure pleasure. If it sells, awesome. But the goal will be just be to enjoy that journey at some point. So mm. I can do that in France. I can do that in Croatia, if that's where she wants to live. But that means we're financially free and I'm working at what I love, but I don't have to make money from it. Mm-hmm. And for her, she's exploring new places because she's a crazy adventurer. That's great. So, so the first two books with Gary. Yep. And you mentioned one of the titles. What was the first title? The first one was The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Okay. And the second one? The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Investor. Okay. Yeah. And we both model those off like the millionaire next door. Like go interview a bunch of people and ask what do they have in common. And so we asked how do you build a big business in real estate in the first one. And I told him from publishing, I said, this is never going to sell. And it's like sold a million copies. I was like, I had no clue about that market. And the millionaire real estate investor is obviously a much bigger known market. There are a lot of people who have money issues and want to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's, like I said, that book changed my life. Yes. So we know the power of associations. And so in interviewing, and this is kind of the, you know, that whole process that we see a lot of authors take and their steps and their processes of, you know, you're associating with these people, you're working with these top people, then you started to blend into these people and then their mindsets and then you've duplicated and the seeds of their thoughts planted in yours and then mm-hmm. you produce and create it. And so it's a very unique process and obviously Gary's very successful and that's really germinated in you. And so from, you know, one question that uh, Nicole, our producer, was asking about investment, um, a new homeowner and um, a happy customer for your yeah. wives. Um, so that's great. And so uh, from the process of investing, what are your suggestions for an individual that is wanting to get into investing is like read the books, get what's the first steps? OK, I'm going to. I'm going to answer that question, but you just said something, the, the power of association. And Jeff lives by this mantra, the Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And he's like super purposeful about it. But I think like I knew that kind of intuitively, like I was a poor student, but I hung out with honor students. And so I made B pluses instead of C's. And I just wasn't motivated, but they were. And because to hang out with them, I had to do better. And I remember when, when I, I wrote a book with Mia Hamm, the soccer player, when I was in New York and she talked about playing up as the best female athlete, like around, she had to play on boys teams. So, and she would not be a good player on those teams, but then she would show up for her matches and be the best player on the field. And so whichever way you look at it, I actually mentally always say, I got to play up, play up, got to play up. I got to play beyond my skill level and hang out with Gary and trying to have people around me. I mean, Inviting you and your wife over to a swimming party is like a, you know, a, like a pill of reality on our fitness level, right? (laughs) Your wife's like, how many months from having a baby and has got a six pack? And you're like, okay, we can do better, right? But it's, you embrace that instead of feeling bad about it. So one, I just wanted to highlight that. That's a huge, huge factor in our success. Um, So investing. If you're going to start down that, I do think you want to understand it at a basic level. You don't have to be an expert. So Go read a couple of books. I mean, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I did not follow the instructions on how to do it, but the paradigm shift of how to think about money was huge. You know, there are people who are going to always be poor because of the way they think about money, and there are people who will be on the right path because of how they think about money. And it's just what's an asset and what's not an asset. I mean, it's just a fundamental thing. Um, The first 122 pages of The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, I was just talking to Gary about it, It's a treatise on how to think about money. And we were just talking about, like, we could just rip those pages out. He literally was meeting with the founder of Tito's Vodka and had cut the book off for the first 122 pages and had it bound because he just wanted, they'd been talking about money and said, just read these 122 pages. And so those were life-changing because Gary had been on this journey for a long time, been super purposeful, and don't reinvent the wheel. You just don't have to. So start with a model and adapt it to who you are. And Wendy and I, like some fundamental principles, starts with having a goal. 
So we had a goal. We want to be net worth millionaires. We want to own a million dollars more of assets than we owe of anything else. So you add up everything you own minus everything you owe. We wanted that to be a million dollars. That has its own value in your life. We had a cash flow goal, $75,000 without having to work for it. And then you just start pursuing what's the thing I have to do to make progress. And so a little knowledge a pl- and a goal will help you determine the action. And you don't even have to come up with the plan. You know, um, Nicole's working um, with our team, and we've got three people on that team that know real estate investor investments in Austin better than I do, for sure, because they're out there on the streets. They're doing the numbers all the time. And so when we started the journey, um, I read books. Every time we went out socially, like my wife would kick me under the table, and I would be prompted, hey, we're thinking about investing in real estate. Does anybody do that? And I was shocked. All these people that worked at the state government, like in, you know, it's like you didn't think of them as real estate moguls. Oh, yeah, I kept my condo from when I was in UT and we rent it. Yeah, we make about 500 bucks a month. I was like, holy crap, we're surrounded by real estate investors and we didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. And we start learning from them and getting more comfortable with it. And then the discipline, if I'm lining these up in my head right, would be then learning to live on less than you make. And because you can't invest in things unless you're saving to invest. And I think that's the number one thing that stops people. They know where they want to go. They want to invest in stocks or they want to invest in real estate, but they haven't figured out how to cut their expenses so that they can save a set amount every month and move forward. And um, simple trick. Do you want me to go farther into this? Because we could it. go. I could go like for an hour just on this because it's like my. We life. won't go that long. But I know. Keep I know. Going. So you just <laughs> put up the stop sign okay. if I'm in the weeds, but. We set a goal back then. This is like when both of our salaries didn't add up to 100000 right? Um, how can we save $1,500 a month after all expenses? And so you start looking at, do we really need cable? Do we really need a new car? You know, you want to start looking at all of those things. Luckily, we didn't have any school debt or we had very little. So that's a, I know a lot of younger people are fighting that battle first, but we asked that question. And so for the first three years, I ended up doing almost $10,000 of freelance work on the weekends because there was just no way with our salary and even living humbly for us to hit that goal. But the way we looked at it is if we could save $1,500 a month back then, that was a down payment on our own property. And because we bought our first house and then bought our second house because we'd been saving up for that down payment, our first house became our first rental property, which is a great strategy for folks. And then we moved into the second house and we bought a few rental properties while we were there. And then we still own the second house and it's a rental property. And the beauty of buying it, living in it for a few years while you're saving up is that you get homeowner financing, which is so much better than investor financing, less down, all of that. And you just, instead of improving it for yourself, you think, what kind of countertops would our future renter want? What kind of flooring would we want for a future renter? Which is all less expensive and a little bit more, I call it bulletproofing. And so we just kind of methodically did that. And you look up and you're like, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. We just have, oh my gosh, look at all the debt we have in real estate. And then, because in Austin, you know, with property taxes, it's very hard to get cash flow. But around five years into owning each of them, just time does its trick. And now it's easy to cash flow those properties and the renters are paying down the debt and we're getting a little bit more on top. And then you start seeing this portfolio grow and grow. Now our focus on is like how fast can we pay down a few of them so that they're completely debt free mm-hmm. and they really become just huge factors in our future financial freedom. So that's like the super short version, right? Have a goal, um, start saving less than, you know, spend less than you earn so that you can save up to invest in that goal and then go into learning from people or books so that you have some sense. And then I would say work with a pro. Mm-hmm. Like it, or a partner or a mentor in the beginning, because one mistake can knock you out of the game, especially in real estate. You make one bad investment and you'll like, I don't want to do this ever again in my life. Got so it. if you start with someone, your odds of that happening go way, way down. So in everything you're talking about starts to make me um, think about your most current book and correct me if I'm wrong, but with the one thing mm-hmm. and really all that you've talked to really makes me think about your one thing was to be financially free. That's been our big family goal. I mean, after being good parents and good spouses, right? Um, that just really appeals to me. You know, I just love the idea. I love going to work. 
I love doing the things I love, but I know a lot of people who drive to work and cry in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. I've, I've interviewed them when they're interviewing for jobs and you're like, gosh, man, I just, you spend 40, 50 hours, at least a week doing something and you want it to be a choice. You don't want it to be a have to. And I would always choose to work because I would be oh, fat and useless if I wasn't. But, you know, I just like it, right? But it's got to be a choice. So f- that was it for me. And I think different people have different reasons. Some people will want to do it because they're passionate about um, raising money for kids with cancer or whatever. Like they want more for their lives, not even for themselves. And some people, like they just blatantly want a Ferrari. I, I'm not going to judge it. Whatever your motivation is, tap into it. And for us, it was that vision of, you know, how quick could we get there? You know, could we retire at 45? Could we retire at 50? Could we, you know, would we is a different question, but could we is the question we were trying to answer. And I've known people who had different motivations. I mean, I've known, I mean, I know a couple of the people who is, it's about stuff. For whatever reason, being able to go out and pay $150,000 for a car, which is just alien to me, like that motivates them to go out and build it bigger and do things. And they end up doing a lot of good with that. And so like just tap into whatever it is that your drive is and let that drive you. So with you and Gary publishing your first two books and then how did the one thing come about and how did y'all get the process to creating that book? Yeah, we, we've written, I think, I guess, 10 books in real estate, right? So we, we, we've been really very active on that level. And then I guess around 2008, 2009, I think it's 2008, um, Gary wrote an essay for a course we were doing. You know, my, my job was working at Keller Williams Realty, um, and I was running our university, and we wrote a course. And he wrote a little essay to go in front of it called The Power of One. And it was like tw- 10 pages, 7 pages, but it was like a little mini version of the book. And I just remember, I said, this is a book, Gary, and I think this is your book. And we all knew it. Like at the moment it showed up that Monday morning and we're reading it, Um, because we were in that space already doing writing books. It's like, this is a book, and if there's one thing that makes him awesome, it's this idea of um, identifying the top priority towards wherever it is you're going and being willing to give that maximal attention. And that's his gift. Like, he's willing, because it's boring most of the time. Like, the thing that matters most often is incredibly monotonous and boring, and he'll stay with it and stay with it and hold everyone around him accountable to not losing, you know, keeping their eye on the ball. So as, a, as someone in publishing now 20 years, when I, I just remember I get chill bumps thinking about it. I was like, this is in perfect alignment with who he is, what he's built, and it's reflective. Like even you look at how, we do, uh, how I talk about our books, it's all about how do you line up those priorities? What's the first step? And if you do that, what's the second step? Because we want people to take action. And so um, it started with an essay. And then we spent five years um, struggling with focus to finish it. We actually wrote another book in between because of the market crash. Um, but, you know, it was a worthwhile effort. That book, you know, as successful as our first book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, has been in our industry. You know, we've now just crossed a million copies in less than four years. Like right? that book's been around for 12, 13, in less than four years now we're up to 800,000 copies of the one thing it's just on a whole different trajectory because it reaches a much larger audience Mm -hmm. so just like an essay it's one of those things like you know something came out it's a little weekend work and we're like wow this is the germ of a much bigger idea and people talk about it there's a lot of books on focus but i think without saying anything truly new i think we brought a new perspective to how you do it and I think that's why it's resonating with people, because it's simple. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about what y'all are doing from the community aspect of the one thing. Yeah. But one of the pieces that is really, I think a lot of top thought leaders are talking about is willpower. Yeah. And yeah, y'all have a really, I think in the book is about the myths or ideas based around certain concepts or ideas and willpower is one of those. Right. And there's this certain amount of energy that you have in your, you know, willpower. So talk about, and I have some more questions about willpower and your thoughts from habits, willpower, 
And sometimes people throw out willpower and just solely focus on habits. I kind of have a belief that habits are, are utmost important, but willpower sometimes will bring you through. Yeah. And so talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, you're talking about the section of the book called The Lies. Mm-hmm. And kind of before we get to the action statements of the book, like how to do the one thing, we wanted to get the bad stuff out of their heads. And so um, the fundamental concept of the one thing is you identify the thing that matters most and you make that thing a habit, right? So that you work to build the habit and then just it becomes like brushing your teeth. Doing that thing that's so important um, is it's just something that's almost automatic for you. And so willpower comes into play and, you know, that expression where there's a will, there's a way. And, you know, especially with, you know, elite athletes, you see them just grit their teeth and just grind through it, right? You, you know, I mean, when I ran the marathon, there was a whole probably eight miles that was pure mental energy. There was nothing else happening because there was nothing left less, but I was just forcing it to go. And I was mentally exhausted at the end of that. That's willpower. It's incredibly powerful. But the trick is it's not always there when you want it. And this was huge for my nutrition. It was huge for my parenting. So um, when you focus on what matters and you ignore something else, you're using measurable mental energy. Like if you took your um, blood sugar level before and after um, and you're trying to decide on what to eat, you're on a diet, and you say yes right to hummus and carrots, and you say no to nachos and beer, both of those decisions would have made a measurable drop in your, in your, blood, your glucose in your bloodstream. And so every decision has an impact. And one of the studies we read shows just how massive it is. There was a, a group of students um, that were asked to memorize either a two-digit number or a seven-digit number, given as long as they wanted. And then they were supposed to leave the classroom, go down the hall, and regurgitate the number. Well, of course, I mean, anybody can memorize a two-digit number or a seven-digit number. So they all succeeded. But the real experiment wasn't about memory. It was about willpower. And so in the hallway between the two rooms was a little table set up. And it said, thanks so much for you know, participating in our experiment. Please choose one of these two free snacks. And one was chocolate cake and the other was fruit. And if you memorized five extra digits, seven instead of two, you were 50% more likely to choose the chocolate cake. And so they call it mental stamina, right? Every decision wears down your ability to make a good decision. And so I looked at that and I'm like, wow, five numbers? undid people's diets. Now I understand why on a Friday at the end of the week, when it's like, you're just gassed, it's so easy to order pizza, right? I mean, I know people, uh, thankfully I'm lactose intolerant, but I can remember like getting the pint of ice cream, you know, and you're just like, oh, you know, you're just like, you know, (laughs) no discipline left at all. And so when you run out of willpower, um, you go to default decision-making. And so without going into all the research, the, the big takeaways are, Um, You need to feed your mind, and you tend to have maximal willpower early in the day. So going back to to tie those together, if you're building your habit, that most important habit for success, it just makes total sense to do it in the morning because that's when you're always going to have the most willpower. I wish I knew the biology, but I think you actually literally store glycogen overnight while you sleep, right? So even if you didn't eat breakfast, you have a better supply And you're going to have more willpower, more reliably, right there in those morning hours to do what it is you need to do. And on the days that you want to do it, it's not a big deal. But it's on those rainy days where you have to tie on the running shoes and go hit the road. That's where your willpower will keep you doing that disciplined thing and making progress when others don't. Is that tied up for you? Because to me, it's all like you need to eat well, feed your mind, right? proteins, complex carbohydrates, things that will break down over a long period of time and give you willpower. And if it really matters, do it in the morning. And that's why you you see these interviews with people and their mornings are just ritualized. They do their meditation, they do their journaling, they do their reading, they do their exercise, they do lots of important things, like before 8 a.m., because they intuitively or purposefully got this and knew that if it was important, this is when I have to do it. That's powerful. Yeah, it's like I said it affected our parenting, right? You have small kids. Kids around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what are two things that always happen? You mm-hmm. give them a snack, and if they're really small, you give them a nap. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I guess moms figured it out a long time ago. 
like that's a natural lull in your willpower. Like we all feel it at work. Like you have your lunch and around two o'clock, like you just want to crawl under the desk and take a nap. So there's this natural energy lull right there. And that's when kids got the snack. They used all their willpower sitting up straight in class. And then they have a conniption fit when they come home with the parent. And so that snack, that nutrition, that little element. So I look at our daughter, Veronica, who is um, willful, and it's going to be a great, great asset to her in her business life. But boy, it's challenging as a parent. And I looked up and I'm like, well, she just had a, a glass of orange juice. She didn't eat a breakfast. I mean, she doesn't have the ability to govern herself right now. So I literally started like putting a little bit of protein in her, you know, orange juice. And we just tried to find ways to, what is a breakfast? Now she'll eat nuts and fruit. Mm -hmm. Like how can we get her to start her day feeding her willpower so she can be a good student and blah, 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 blah. And I try to take that advice myself. So I'm kind of take a left here. Um, yeah. And <laughs> you, y'all paused the one thing when uh, we had the great recession and y'all wrote another book. Yeah, that was shift. And it was like for how to manage a specifically a real estate business in a severely downturned market. And Gary's lived through two of those, and we just did a bunch of interviews and kind of, we came up with 12 tactics. And some of them would apply to any business, but it's, you know, there's a way to go into a recession and come out ahead, and there's a way to go into a recession and go out of business. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeffrey Calkins, the fortune writer, wrote a great book called The Upside of the, of the Downturn. And one of the things I took out of that is, if you lose market share in a recession, you're unlikely to ever get it back. If you gain market share in a downturn, you're unlikely to ever give it up. And so just like market crashes are a great time to invest because values are depressed, it's a great time to disrupt your competition. Because while they're fighting just to pay the bills, if you're way ahead of the game, you can then be doing things they can't afford to do and just grabbing market share. So that was, that was the book we wrote in the interim because you know, I have a job as real estate in a real estate company, what do we need to do to serve them? So we hit pause for like a year, knocked that book out, and went back to the one thing. So from the standpoint of you being an investor, you starting in the early 2000s, and by 2007, 2008, how was that directly correlating and inf impacting your venture with your business? You know, um, so the timing worked for us, and Austin worked for us. Um, so we had the tech bubble, you know, in 99, 2000. So when we bought our first house in 2001, we were like, we paid $175,000 for that little house on Heather Street. You know, it's a 2-1, tiny, like an 11th of an acre. And we're like, oh my gosh. We just bought it. Back then it was the DMZ too. It wasn't even a nice neighborhood. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know, now the recession's here. Like, we'll never get our money out of this house. And, but Austin, for whatever reason, you know, the tech bubble, we never saw the big bubble in the real estate. Like we just kind of had regular real estate growth. So when the bubble burst in Austin, we didn't see a giant depression in home values. So we didn't have the, we didn't get hurt like some people did who already owned real estate, but we still had the benefit when we were buying those first two and three and four properties that we could put five and 10% down. Um, you know, we did it with other investors. Like we found a guy who wanted to invest, who had no, didn't want to do the work. Two different people loaned us $25,000 for a 50% equity. You know, he said, if you'll pay the down payment, we'll manage it and we'll do everything and you'll own half. And so we did whatever it took to kind of keep the, you know, acquisitions going. I don't necessarily recommend that because owning something long-term is a partnership and that's a whole other topic. But we just, we had the benefits of looser lending so that we were able to do it. Um, but we managed to keep doing that even afterwards, right? You just had to put more cash down, you know, now it's 25% and you won't get as good of terms. Um, but in, you know, the, the downside here is like, while we didn't see the bubble pop or whatever, it also meant that our value, we never got those screaming deals. I mean, I knew people who were buying like row houses in Atlanta and Detroit for you know twenty thousand and getting three hundred a month in cash flow, mm. and you're like, I mean, what's the down payment you know on a twenty thousand dollar house? You know, I'm going to buy ten, <laughs> and you know, I don't do the long distance thing. I'm not into that, but I knew a lot of people who did. So Austin had its pluses and minuses. Like every every market has its deals, but we did weather that. But you know, we got a little benefit on the front end from not having to put as much down, but. Um, you know, we got, we've had solid, steady appreciation. 
which has been very nice for us. So how many homes and properties do y'all currently have in y'all's portfolio? Oh, this is embarrassing. I should know. Um, we have six rental properties and we have nine properties overall. Um, we inherited kind of a family we bought from her Wendy's father, like a, a lake house up in uh, Minnesota. And he got ill with stage four cancer and we wanted to, you know, one, help him out and make sure that the property stayed in the family. And I guess it could be a cash flow property. We're looking into it, but it's just something we own. But thankfully it's paid for and the taxes are like 1200 a year. So um, we own our personal property and a ranch and everything else is, is an actual rental property mm -hmm. um, that was bought either to live in and then rent, you know, or just purely as a rental. We just bought our last one in January. Okay. So now, um, kind of moving back to the one thing in the last four years and the growth and the sell of the book, and now I know you brought Jeff on to help manage the mm -hmm. direction of where that is going, because now, you know, a book can turn into a lot of new opportunities other than just the purchase and read type of situation. Right. So tell me what you guys have planned with the one thing. And Well, we saw an opportunity. Um it wasn't just a business book, first and foremost. You know, like that first time I spoke, you had all of your you know, CrossFit trainers out there. I'm like, wow, okay, so this is also for physical health. And it was so we, we've seen people from a lot of different industries and walks of life. So we started to get this aha that it wasn't just going to be one of those books that showed up for a year. It, for the last, except for August, we had 24 straight months of year over year it was going up. And you're just like, that's word of mouth. It's growing. So um, when I started looking for um, Jeff, I was watching other authors in the space, and I knew that they were building communities, and they were building training. And books are not incredibly profitable. If you're writing books to make money, like most people in publishing would just laugh. It's just reality. You're stacking nickels and quarters, and it's great. It's passive income, but it's not like other kinds of business ownership. The margins are just really, really small. But the bigger opportunity is to build something that the book leads people to. And so um, we started building online training and our first community is called Time Blocking Mastery. And time blocking is kind of the idea of um, taking a 66 day challenge to build your first habit. And we have a, a 10 week course and a community to help people go through that process. And you know, the community has been huge because people share, this is my day 23, I just go in there almost every day, and people are asking questions. Can I add something else? And I'm like, no, you know, stick to your one thing until it's a habit. And different people have different challenges, and we've just learned a lot from it. And we've also learned that people really love to do things as a group. So people are pursuing very specific challenges. Some of them are trying to be a better parent. Some of them are trying to build a better business. A lot of them, a huge percentage of them, are pursuing health goals because they see that as a foundational issue. They can't run a great business if they have no energy to do it. They can't be a great parent if they have no energy to do it. So a disproportionate number of people, I'd say 40, 45% are doing some sort of health goal. I'm going to sleep regularly. I'm going to wake up and exercise. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do yoga. The list goes on and on. Um, but that's the, the first stop on that journey. We felt like that was the, we asked we had 40,000 people on our email list. We asked them, what's the number one thing you're struggling with? And they said, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just struggling to block it on my calendar and keep that commitment, time block it. So that was how, that's how we decided to do it. And then we just dove in and made every mistake in the world. But it's successful. That's yeah, like great. Every so you, you're actively involved with that process? I was in the beginning, right? This is that whole thing going back to... Um, I'm not the best person to be running the company day to day. And knowing that about myself is important. Um, so I set the vision, um, and as a co-author on the, the video training, I was the guy on camera. Um, but I gave Jeff three days. I said, you've got three days of my time, but you've got to build it, you've got to think it through, you've got to write the scripts, you've got to, because if you're gonna have ownership in this, I want it to be your DNA. Because if I'm doing it all, like, why are you here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the attitude we tend to take. And so I did the first one for him. And so he's just launching a secondary product. that We identified something else that people were struggling with, and he's launching, you know, a $97 product, which is more of an introduction into selecting your one thing. And because that was another challenge, he had to do that on his own. So my job is I meet with him once a week, 
and we go over his priorities. I, I test his thinking. Remember, vision and standards are the other two big things that I hold on my main job description as a business owner. So I sit down and I coach him. I try to hold him accountable to staying on the vision because those people who are the best builders builders are also like the number one sufferers of squirrel syndrome. Like mm-hmm. he's like, oh, we could go do this. Oh, we could do this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You haven't finished this. Let's build the foundation and that'll make all that other stuff possible. If you just be patient, build the foundation. That's been my mantra this year. So that's, that's it. That's great. Try to well, keep it simple. That's, that's great. Um, we're going to move to kind of our rapid fire and just some sure. questions. And I know that Nicole kind of set you up. So first is what has been one of your greatest struggles and how have you overcome that? Well, that's been the theme here, right? I think that for someone who discovered late in life that they needed to be an entrepreneur, right? That was going to be the thing that would get me to my goals the fastest. I had to overcome the fact that I'm much more behaviorally suited to be a writer than a business owner. And that's just about filling in the missing, missing pieces. So um, I didn't understand that in the beginning. And I was trying to do those things. And I was successful in short bursts. And I, did, I definitely became a better manager. But knowing that that wasn't natural for me was a huge gift. Like it was just liberating. All right, great. So now I have to think big enough for two every time because I'm going to require that extra person but it was just a huge liberating gift. So that, that's that been the challenge to remind myself because if you're the person who has the vision and sees how to do it, it takes patience to wait for that other person to catch up and be able to do it at the speed that you could. And making sure that I do that, um, I'm lucky to have Gary holding me accountable. You know, I watched him make that mistake. He got an idea, didn't wait to find the leader and launched it, and guess who got to run that company? He did. And he just, he was, he's very transparent with me. He goes, you know, I, you know, I'm holding you accountable, but I just went ahead and jumped ahead. I thought I had the leader. I didn't test it long enough. And now I got the job back. Don't make that mistake. He told me that like every month when I was waiting to find Jeff. So that's the struggle. It's just as an entrepreneur, as someone who has that, those visions, you, you've done it. You, you see what needs to be built, what's missing in the world, what you are really drawn to do the patience to wait to find the right team to do it takes an extraordinary effort for me at least. Maybe other people do it naturally, but that's the thing that I have to come back to again and again. It's great. And uh, next question is, what is some of the best or your greatest impact advice that has been given to you? You know, I was like thinking about that. I was like, no one succeeds alone is the first thing. That's kind of a mantra, right? That I say to myself, it's one of the lines I learned from Gary And that's that reminder to build around me, not just make it about me. Um, But it's it's at different periods of my life, right? You know, like I had struggles with confidence and, you know, you get advice on that. I could go to my journey as a public speaker. You know, best advice I ever got there is practice four hours for every hour you're on stage. But if I had to narrow it down to one, it's going to be boring and similar. It's, It's no one succeeds alone. Like, that's it. That's the thing that whether you're investing, whatever journey you're on, you're going to be better with a partner, a mentor, or a coach, period. And I'd love to have all three every single time, but I'll take at least one, right? And I love having a great coach. I love having a mentor, and I love having a partner because I think it makes the journey funner, more reliable, and just easier all around. So that's what that translates to me. Got it. And then uh, being influenced by um, books, movies, podcasts, hmm. what are some of your tops in those categories? Um, the book thing is like a moving target. I have a, a shelf in my, in my office, and I, when I really like a book, I'll go buy like a couple dozen of them and just give them away. And I would say the books I've given away the most in the last year um, are a book called The Defining Decade by Dr. Meg Jay, and it's about 25, ages 25 to 35. And um, Gary's son's girlfriend is the one who kind of introduced it to our group. She was reading it in the back car on a road trip and started talking about it. Then we started talking about it. And basically one of the big things is a lot of people think those years right after college are throwaway years. Like this is my time to go play and have fun. I don't have to get serious till later, but 75% of your lifetime income growth will happen in that decade. The person you're most likely to marry is the person you'll meet in that decade. There's all these big moments of truth 
And so it's just a, it's a psychologist who specialized in working with people that are struggling with that period of time. And I found it super awesome for me, just one, to reflect on my life. But I'm also working with a lot of younger people. It helps me be a better mentor and a manager for them to know what the answers to some of those questions are. So that's huge. Like, I've never had anybody read that book and not come back and thank me. It's like, wow, I just got like a, a LinkedIn message from someone I don't even remember talking to about it, saying, wow, she finally got around to reading it, and it was just huge for her. So that's number one. And number two is much more recent. Um, there's a guy named Salim Ishmael, and he wrote a book called Exponential Organizations. And he's the guy that is building Singularity University. Um, and I think that's Peter Thiel's uh, operation. I might be mixing up the billionaire, you know, gurus out there. <laughs> but it's the whole idea is they looked at, um, they call them unicorn companies, these companies like Uber and Tesla and, you know, that have sprouted up and in a very short period of time gotten billion dollar valuations. And like in, you know, like three Instagram, like in three or four years, how do they do it? And they broke it down into um, 12 qualities. And if you have like five of them, you have the ability to grow at that rate. And seeing where the world's going, technology, seeing how fast things are capable of changing, um, it's a good primer, as someone who owns businesses, is my business ready to exist and compete in a world where those companies are sprouting up? And how do I bring those qualities to my business? So depending on who you are, it's a very dry read, or like my entrepreneur friends are like, I couldn't put it down. And then some other people are like, ah, it's a little dry. But for me, it's like I'm listening, like, what are the lessons I can take from this book? Yes, I think the author is, uh, or the, the founder is, is it Diamandi? Yeah. Yes, Peter Diamandis is the X-Prize. Yes. There yes. we go. Yes. Or, I'm probably mispronouncing the name. He's the X-Prize guy. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Anyways, yeah. Um, and then uh, movies, podcast, any in that, that area that you, you know, are inspired by? Movies or? are my ultimate relaxation tool. So um, when I, I, novels too. Um, so like when I want to turn my brain off and relax, that's what I do. Get my book, get in my favorite chair. I read, um, the number one place we go on date night is the Alamo draft house, much to my very social wife's chagrin, right? Go sit in a dark theater and not talk for two hours. <laughs> um, best movie I've seen this year is the West Texas film, um, hell or high water. Fabulous. Just absolutely. It's funny and perfect in almost every way. It's a solid movie. I couldn't narrow it down because I'm just, I go see too many and I watch too many. Like I watched one last night, just like got my ear plug earphones in. So like I got an hour and a half before I have to go to bed before my workout this morning. I'm going to just crank in a movie and I just tune out and I sleep like a baby afterwards. So, um, gosh, what would you say? Podcast. Um, I've been all over the map and exploring that because like you, we're, we're, we're launching one and, Obviously, I like to selectively listen to Lewis Howes and Tim Ferriss. Both of them, when they interview great people, it's just amazing. The quality of guests they're able to get is off the charts. Um, I've enjoyed Pat Flynn at different times. He has the smart passive income, and he's very much into a lot of the, the specific how-tos on, around things that I've been playing with. Um, and then on my reader geek side, my friend Tim Grawl started a podcast called the Story Grid Podcast. And they're just breaking down the anatomy of a novel. And like this week, they did nonfiction books. And you have to be a bit of a book geek, but it's fascinating. They break down your favorite books, tell you why they work and why they don't work. And for me, as someone who that's my path to mastery, I just I love listening to that. So I guess those are the ones that are in pretty high rotation right now. Got it. That's good. Yeah. All right. Next question for you is what are three insights or advice that you give to somebody that could directly impact their life immediately? Um, you know, this is coming out of the one thing, which is if you had to put a book before any of the other books, like what's the approach you take, right, for whatever it is you want. So um, get clear about what you want. I think the we define success as getting what you want, and that's the struggle for most people. They don't know what they want. So taking the time to be honest with yourself and ask the people who love you, what is it that actually makes me happy? It's amazing that we could be out of touch with that, but it's something that I find very, very common. Um, people might know the direction they need to be going, but have no idea the destination. And that's a start. Like I, That's good enough for me. Like I want to go south where it's warmer. Awesome. Start going there. You'll figure out what town you need to live in later. But picking at least a, a direction 
that they know is the right direction for them is an incredibly worthwhile because that determines everything else, right? Um, once you've determined where you want to be going, at least a direction, I'd say figure out the most important thing that you need to do, um, that one thing, and then make that a habit. And to me, that simple formula, where am I going? What's the one thing that's most important for getting there? And can I make a stand around doing that thing? Just do it first thing when I get to work or whatever. Um, it's so simple, right? That people just want to dismiss it. But when you do that battle plan again and again, it's just so effective. So I think those, those simple steps are just hugely important for people to get what they want. That's great. And then um, kind of coming to a conclusion here, um, if people want to find your books or find your content information, what's the best way to get uh, in touch with you? Um, they can definitely uh, find me at theonething.com with the number one. Um, that's where our book lives. Um, there's links from there to all my social channels. Um, I spend a little time every week on Facebook, Twitter, in, you know, Instagram's my guilty habit. Um, and you know, I, I do respond. Like I get a lot of people who are like, I'm reading your book, I have a question. And so I try to be responsive there. Um, that's part of my job. And if they actually wanted to actually get together, you know, every year in November, we host a charity poker tournament. Um, it's called Hold'em for Heroes. If you're in Austin, check it out. We, you know, if you care about kids with cancer, we raised $111,000 and managed to get uh, Christmas delivered to all the kids in cancer wards in Austin. And it's one of those things, I went to play one year, five years ago, was so moved by what they were doing, I joined the committee, and now my wife and I have been leading it for three years. And so that's a guaranteed FaceTime right there, um, and for a good cause too. That's awesome. Well, we appreciate your time today, and uh, it, was, it was a great interview. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us on the Amplify Podcast. You can find more at theamplifypodcast.com, our social links to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Join us in conversation. Let us know what you're thinking and how we can best service you guys. We will see you again really soon.